All right. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. A very good reminder for all of us. While you're doing that, I want to welcome all the way to the back, Brother Jeru. Jeru, God bless you. Coming in with uh, Sister Wynn. God bless you. Thanks for being here and joining us. Um, are you turning to Matthew chapter 11? Three verses there, 28, 29, and 30. Very nice. Some of you have memorized this. Some of you have made this a very comforting verse that you have memorized. And I encourage you, go ahead and mark that in your Bible or memorize that. Very good verses. While you're doing that, I also want to remind those of you that are in the New Testament survey class. You have exams today. I know. Some of your friends from the East Coast are preparing for that same exam. Uh, some of you I saw preparing. Some of you, God's grace will bring you through. <laughs> but you do have exams later. Um, you're welcome to join us uh, here. Maybe have the exams while we're doing the garage sale here. Some of you are doing the exams. It's still on our system. Matthew, 28, or Matthew 11, 28 to 30, says this. Jesus speaking. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Lord, I add your blessing to the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our meditation. In Jesus' name, amen. I will give you rest. What a comforting promise. I will give you rest. Are you stressed? Stressed out? Some of you are already sick physically because of the stress. Some of you have swelling and calcification in your joints. You can't even walk properly because of the stress. Goodness, you need this word. Our bodies are actually designed to handle some stress. Did you know that? Your body is actually able to handle some stress. Normally, we can withstand healthy doses of stress from time to time. Certain degree of stress. Maybe, you know, it can actually be helpful. You stress or good stress. You know, if, if you go through life, you're, there's tests, there's drills, there's challenges. Stress is our body's natural or instinctive survival response to any threat or any difficulty or danger. Your body reacts by in certain ways and that builds up stress. So it's natural to cope with emergency situation, emergency situations. The body actually releases hormones, produces fluids, and redistributes new I've been reading a lot because of what I'm going through. <clears throat> why, why is this important? Too much stress, though, too much stress causes damage and dysfunction to your body, your mind, your spirit, and even your relationships. I'll say that again. Stress by itself is something that we can handle, but too much stress can actually damage or cause dysfunction to your body, mind, spirit, and your relationships. If our stress button is pressed too frequently, our body is in a continuous state of alert. It's like your body is always on like a very sensitive area. Our body doesn't have a chance to rest and recover. Then we suffer anxiety, depression, and a host of physical, mental, spiritual health problems. That's, that's what happens when you're not managing stress well. We live in a very stressful culture, very stressful world, 
very stressful time. What we need, and that's the problem, the problem is not just the stress, but there's too much stress that's not managed properly. What happens is our physical bodies, we have high, I mean, I won't ask anymore, how many of you have high blood pressure? How many of you have elevated heart rates constantly? How many of you, your bodies are storing fat and having skin problems and losing sleep? Your metabolism will slow down. Your dis the systems of your body have dysfunctions. You have illnesses and disease and chronic pain. Or just talking about some physical effects. How about mentally? Some of us, and it's become a serious issue, especially during this pandemic. Depression, suicide rates, neurosis, psychosis, episodes of this, pessimism, confusion, eating disorders, uh, ADD, ADHD, BPD, ABC, bipolar, panic attacks, addictions, substance abuse. There's just too much of that going on. Socially, there's a lot of cranky people. Crankiness, defensiveness, ob obnoxious. The, have you met obnoxious people? Don't, you, you know, people are not listening anymore. Everyone's talking. Actually, not, not just talking. Everyone's shouting. Everyone's angry. Everyone's argumentative, difficult, isolated. Ultra sensitive, angry. Crime is on the rise. Respect is, and rudeness, it seems to be the, all, all of this actually stress related disorders, diseases, and dysfunctions. We're talking about a very stressful culture and people are not managing it well. There's no rest for our bodies, our relationships, for our minds. Then we have these disorders coming up. We need to rest. We need this promise when Jesus tells us, I will give you rest. Some of you today, this morning, you woke up and you're tired. You need to claim the promise, the promise of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily laden. I will give you rest. This news article from Tacoma recently had a basset hound and this owner of the basset hound, the dog, out for a slow drive. Put his dog on a leash, put his dog in the back seat, closes the door, but the dog was actually still outside the car. He just locked in the car. He wasn't looking probably on his phone. He's too stressed out. So the, the leash was inside, connected to the dog that was still outside the car. Gets into the car. This is a true story. And he starts to drive around. It's a good thing that it's only, he was going maybe 20, 25 miles per hour. A few blocks from where he was, the house, he was stopped by a Tacoma motorcycle officer. Stop speed about 2025. Poor dog. His tongue was out. He was panting heavily. Some bruises and bumps. Falling down, rolling over, being dragged. He was still alive, but really, really confused and really, really angry. Talk about stress. This dog has been through a lot. You know what that dog reminds us? It reminds me of some of us. It reminds me really of some of us. We get to the end of the week like a Sunday. We look at one another and like, wow, you've been through a lot. Look around you. Look, look to the left, look to the right. Do they look like they've been dragged around by life? Like stress has been high. Like life has beaten up on them. And uh, hey, yeah, yes, yesterday you were 25 years old, now you look 45. <laughs> Stress, that's that. Go ahead and tell them, Jesus says, I will give you rest. Jesus promises, I will give you rest. Look at that verse again. There's three verbs, three 
words I need you to look at that tells us what we need to do. It's more like an imperative, not a request, not a suggestion, not an option, something that we need to do. Action words that tell us what we need to do so that we get rest. Number one, Jesus says, come, come. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and tired and stressed and anxious and worried and drawn in many directions, confused, depressed, sick. Those of you that are feeling these disorders, come. Come to me and I will give you rest. <clears throat> Someone wisely said, gain a life of rest when you give God the rest of your life. Start today. Some of you that have not made that a habit, start today. Give God the rest of your life so that you can gain a life of rest in Christ. Life is like a daily grind. That's really a rough versus rough kind of thing. I wish I had sandpaper to show you when sandpaper sand is ru you know, uh, um, rubbing against another sand. That, that's sometimes how it feels like. The grind of things. The everyday things. The heat. The traffic. The stress. The lack of provisions or the you know, overabundance of provisions. Anyone suffering from that? The difficult people. Difficult commute. Difficult in terms of um, just handling everyday things. That's called the daily grind. The heavy burden of living with, me with, hopefully with meaning and responsibility. It is tiring. It is stressful. You live in the 21st century, you will experience stress. Look at the original sense of this word. The original sense of the imperative was actually Jesus was addressing the Jews, the Jews that were feeling the heavy burden of man-made religion. You know, the Pharisees were putting on rituals and ceremonies, you know, do's and don'ts to them in trying to follow the Ten Commandments. You know, there's Ten Commandments, but you know, because of their clarifications, the Pharisees added like 613 more regulations over the Ten Commandments to tell you what it means. That's why Jesus was saying, wow, this is such a heavy, stressful, and this is trying to please God. God, Jesus was saying, it's just too heavy. He doesn't say, note there, he doesn't say, if you need rest, go to church more. If you need rest, read your Bible more. Or if you need rest, pray more. Or don't just give 10%, give 20%. He doesn't say that. It's not a program. It's not an activity, it's a person. Jesus says, come to me. If you're tired, if you're, if you're stressed in any way, come to me. He's inviting you. He's telling you, come to this person. Matthew 23, 4, Jesus described these leaders, those that were making it hard for the Jews. It says, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And Jesus says, enough. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Bill Crowder. This is from Our Daily Bread. Some of you read that daily. The rest he offers is not simply found in the cessation of activity, or release from burdens. It is found in actively seeking His presence and His provision for our lives. That's nice. Look at these verses that Jesus uses to refer to Himself. He was not saying do this or do that or avoid this and avoid that. That's probably necessary, but first and foremost, come to me, Jesus chapter, in John chapter 6. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We're talking about deep down, 
satisfaction. Some of us are striving, some of us are working. We just don't get the satisfaction. Why? Because we're looking for an activity, a program. Something to keep us busy when all we need is the person and the presence of Jesus. He is the bread of life. John chapter 7, 37-38. Jesus stood out and said, stood and cried out and said, If any man is thirsty, again, there's a longing. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Not only is there deep down satisfaction with Jesus, there's deep down refreshment. Refreshment. Wow. Like a cool stream on a very hot summer. Like a burst of joy in a very sad and dark world. Like a flash of light in a darkened world. Jesus gives that refreshing, satisfying presence. Look at John chapter 14. Remember the beginning of this, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Later on in John chapter 14, he says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift this world cannot give. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. If you're troubled, afraid, confused, depressed, sad, lonely, anxious, don't look for an activity or even the lack of it. You look for Jesus. Some of you are looking for a miracle today. Don't look for miracles. Look for Jesus. Amen? Stop looking for miracles. If Jesus is in your, in your life, miracles will happen. Stop seeking the miracle and seek Jesus. Come to me for the satisfaction. Come to me for the inspiration. Come to me for the refreshment and encouragement that is deep down. It will improve your health, your mental state, your relationships. It will improve your general perspective and outlook in life. That's why it makes sense, Jesus was saying, come to me. It's as simple, Jesus, Jesus was saying, come. Pastor, if it's as simple as coming to Jesus, why aren't people, sensible people, why aren't they coming? Why? If it's as simple as you say it is, and it's as simple as Jesus promised, why are people not coming? I have one answer. It's a guess. Because they have not experienced it. They have not, they have not even known about it. They thought they have to strive. They thought they have to create some kind of scenario where, where they do their best effort. First and foremost, you come to Jesus. Just the way you are. It's tiring. It's tiring. Your life, my life, our lives together. A pandemic that hopefully we're looking back at already. It's tiring. You look at your family. You look at the, the daily grind you're in. <sighs> Some of you can't just, <sighs> you need to. Because <sighs> you're tired already. You need to be refreshed. Encouraged. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in God. Come to me, he says. We assume that people know how, and we assume that they know what's really going on. But we don't. A lot of us, we don't. We have an idea. We have some suggestions here and there. We have a lot of YouTube videos that tell us about this and that. We got a lot of supplements in our medicine cabinet. But what will really bring healing, restoration, refreshment? It's not an activity. Pastor, maybe more church activity. That'll help. That'll help draw you to Jesus. But it's not that activity per se. Amen? Wait, did, did we get that straight? We're, we're not talking about filling up your calendar with churchy stuff. Because that doesn't lessen the stress. For some, I know even some pastors that, that, that are sick today because of the stress they put on themselves. Come to Jesus. Get Jesus into your life. 
And how will they know unless we tell them? How will they know unless they hear from us that have experienced Jesus? Come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Number two, walk. Walk with me, Jesus says. My yoke, take my yoke upon you. Why? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Pastor, I had eggs this morning. Are you talking about yolk? <laughs> you know, that's a different yolk, right? Y-O-L-K. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Y-O-K-E. Let me show you what a yolk is. There you go. Oh, Pastor, they look like handcuffs. No. <laughs> They're the type that you put around the neck of an animal. A yoke is a type, what does it say there? A type of harness that connects a pair of, what? Oxen, cows, bulls that, that will pull. I'll show you a few more pics of a, it's a type of harness that pulls that for, it's commonly used metaphorically to refer to submission to a teacher. So, take my yoke upon you. I'm the teacher. Jesus said, take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden, what I pull with this yoke, is light. In the New Testament, to take the yoke of means, usually refers to a rabbi, like teacher, like, a, like Jesus, and refers to becoming submitted, uh, becoming a submitted student of a certain teacher. So if I'm a follower of Christ, I will take on the yoke of Christ. That's what it means. If I'm a follower of Gamaliel, I will take on the yoke of Gamaliel. As used in this passage, okay? That's, this is the word. Let me show you a few more. This is in actual use. These are not, no cows were hurt with this illustration, all right? Just for, it, it, these are oxen. That's the yoke upon, you see that, 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 I, you see that the, the piece of wood connecting both? Usually one is bigger and one is smaller. One is older, one is younger. One is the leader, one is the experienced, one is the master, one is the teacher. On the other side is the novice, the new one, the newbie. Yeah, let me show you another one. Wow, more like a Philippine setting, right? That looks like in, it's in Yakima or something. I don't know. It can also be used for caribou or carab carabaos. Huh? <clears throat> I think I have one more. Oh, oh, it's the same one. Oh, no, that's their twins. All right. A man observed a farmer with his team of oxen plowing the field. The man noticed that one of the animals seemed a lot bigger than the other animal it was yoked with. So he asked the farmer. The farmer replied, but he asked, why is that? One's bigger, one's smaller. The older ox is the best ox I've ever had, farmer says. He knows his way around the field. The reason I put the younger one with him is so the older, more knowledgeable ox could teach the younger ox to plow. If I never put them together, the younger one would never learn. By himself, the younger ox would pull himself to death. But together... He learns to cooperate with, the, with and rest in the strength of the older ox. I'll read that last phrase. By himself, the younger ox would pull himself to death. But together, he learns to cooperate with and rest in the strength of the older ox. So it is with us when Jesus was saying, take my yoke upon you. We come to Jesus, we take his yoke, we bind ourselves to Jesus, and we do what this younger ox is doing. You learn from Jesus. You learn the ways. You learn what to do and what not to do. How to do it. How to live your life. Come to Jesus, connect with him. That's why a, in terms of a yoke, uh, it means three things. Let me, let me put the three things here. To walk with Jesus means to have a vital connection with Him. That's our theme, connecting. If you're not connected to Jesus, you're not being with 
Jesus. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're doing your own thing. And there's times in your life you just simply intersect with Jesus. Some of us intersect a lot with Jesus, usually Sunday mornings. We have these intersections with Jesus. That's not being a follower of Christ. Being a follower of Christ is to be yoked with Him, to be led by Him, to be vitally connected to Jesus. See, yokes are always made of two, not one. We were not meant to go through life living apart from God. His yoke fits well and it's lighter than the one we've been pulling ourselves. So connect to Jesus. Do it today. Pastor, he is part of my life. Have you been just intersecting with him on a Sunday morning? Intersecting with him when times are low? Or is Jesus a vital part of who you are and how you do life? Connect with him today. Not only that, it will give you the necessary direction. Some of us confuse. We don't know where to go. Some of us are at a point in our life we need to make important decisions. We can't make those decisions because we're lacking the guidance. We're lacking the principles and the values that we need. Get direction from Jesus. Direction means to go with him. Not just to be with me, but to go with me. The idea of a yoke pictures the forward motion of two connected together. You cannot be yoked to Jesus and go your own way anymore. You've tried your way. I've tried my way. You've tried your way. How is that going for you? If you're tired, striving, try this. Try Jesus. Connect with him and go with him. We follow him and his direction for our life. Follow Jesus. You want to call him your Savior, also call him your Lord. Accept him into your life to forgive your past and now be empowered in your present so that you have a glorious future. Go with Jesus. Not only do you need to obey him, you need to cooperate with him. You can't just always try to rebel, always try to be pulling it your way. Do you picture yourself being yoked with Jesus and you trying to tell Jesus, this is how we should do it, Jesus. This is how you will answer my prayers. This is the schedule that you will follow. And this is the person you will, you will allow me to marry. And this is the kind of work you will bless because this is what I like. And you keep tugging, keep pulling, keep striving. That's stressful in itself. Surrender. Surrender and cooperate with Jesus. That's why cooperation means to work with me. Walk with me means be with me, go with me, work with me. It's Jesus telling you, hey, 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 shh, hush, work with me here. My plans are good plans for you. My plans are there for your good and for your growth. Work with me. To be yoked together means that we cooperate with the master. We are joined to his work in our lives, so that our lives make an eternal impact. There's meaning. There's purpose. What you're going through, if you surrender, and it's difficult, you can actually say, well, God, you know what you're doing. I don't. You know, so I'm trusting you. Takes a lot of faith. Takes a lot of courage. Takes a lot of trust. The yoke is actually a place of labor. Jesus is inviting us to walk with him, work with him, go with him. The rest that Jesus refers to is not lazy, do-nothing kind of thing. Were you hoping for that? It's like, I will give you rest. I want to be lazy in the present. I, I don't want to be doing anything. It's not that. It's work. It's a yoke. But he carries the load. And he leads you with it. It's a yoke that you don't have to carry. It actually carries you. Take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy. My yoke is light. <clears throat> Sometimes we act as if we're the ones leading Jesus instead of him 
leading us. Yes, we're connected in a relationship with him. I know Jesus. I know about him. He's, a, he's my savior. He's forgiven me. He blesses me. But we tell him what to do instead of going to him to ask, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life, with my education, with my marriage, with my relationships, with, with my work? What do you want me to do in terms of my health? What do you want me to do in terms of my business and my finances? How should we answer when, when Jesus gives you directions? We put Jesus as president, but we want to function as prime minister. We want to be CEO, CIO, COO. But we want Jesus as Lord and Savior, as a title. Careful. <clears throat> Walk with him, get direction, connection, cooperation. Last. Not the least. What does, what, what, what's your guess? Look at, the, look at your Bible. <laughs> learn. It says learn. Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. Learn from me. The Greek word that Jesus used, matete. Matete. Which means a disciple. A follower. That's why we, we call ourselves Christ followers. Disciples of Christ. Mathetes of Christ. <clears throat> Greek, mathetes or matete. Follower or disciple. That's why he's called the teacher. The leader. The teacher that he is. In every circumstance, we follow him. Why? There is something to learn. If he's the teacher... If he's the expert, then what I'm going through, and I'm yoked with him, what I'm going through, I have something to learn. There's a purpose. There's a reason why you're going through what you're going through if Jesus is Lord. It, this is kind of hard for, for many to accept. I don't see, until now really, I don't really see a, a whole picture of why we have to go through a pandemic. Some of us have suffered some loss during the pandemic. Death in the family, death in some relationships, death in terms of our employment. Some of us have, are still suffering some of the consequences of what we've gone through in the past few months, few years. It's hard to understand why. Of course we ask questions like why. We don't know. Jesus was saying you have to learn from this. Are you learning from him? Are you learning from life? Ask yourself that. It's like, are you learning from life? Pastor, why do I keep going through this test? It's because you haven't passed it. If you passed it, you'll go on to the next test. Pastor, why do I keep going through grade one test? Because you haven't passed it. If you pass grade one, guess what? Next year, go to grade two. Right? You're not learning. Which reminds me, uh, there's this pastor that preached a sermon. Preached again after a, a week. The third week preaches this again. The elder, one of the elders of the church comes to him. Um, pastor, do you, do you have other sermons prepared? Because we noticed the past two or three Sundays, have been preaching the same passage. Do you have other sermons? Pastor simply says, Oh yeah, I do. As soon as you learn this one, I'll move on to the next. Sometimes God is just telling you, Learn. Why will I make you go through a harder, more difficult time when you haven't learned what you need to learn right here and now? So stop complaining. Stop arguing with God. Stop fighting and rebelling against God. Submit to him and ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to learn? Jesus says, learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Gentleness, he says. Gentleness is meekness under control. Or meekness, strength under control. The picture is of a tamed animal. Think about a, a strong horse 
about 1,000 pounds of horsepower there. It has great strength, yet once it's tamed, it, great things can happen. If you know how to harness that strength and that power. It can pull a plow through a field and help bring about a harvest. If you put a saddle upon it, a child can ride it. Even a small child can enjoy a very powerful animal like a horse. That's the picture of gentleness. It's strength under control. Jesus was saying, I have the power. I can actually solve the problem right here, right now. But learn, learn from me. Trust in me. The other word picture for gentleness is the word gentle, the way we use it for gentle medicine. Some of you have been taking a lot of medicine. I have not been sleeping for more than two hours a night because of some medicines. They're not very gentle. Gentle medicine is medicine that is easy on your stomach. It won't upset your stomach. Some medicines we take, in, uh, it upsets us. You know what I'm talking about. And we're told to take some medicine with food so that we, we don't get nauseated or sick. Gentleness is not only good for you, but it is also good for the people around you. Some of you need gentleness, not just because it's good for you and your, your tummy. It's actually good for the people around you. Lord, why are you giving me gentleness? Oh, I'm answering the prayer of the person beside you. Lord, why are you giving me so much love in my heart? I'm answering the person, the, 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 the person you're living with. Did you stop to consider that? That maybe I'm learning from this, not just for my good, not just for my benefit, but for the consequence and benefit of those around me. Have you ever stopped to think that you're going through what you're going through and God has been answering your prayers because he wants you to be a blessing to others? Or were you all just about yourself? Gentleness. Wow. <laughs> Gentleness is not only good for you, but it's good for the other persons in your life. That's why you also need not just gentleness, in terms of character, but humbleness or humility. Lowliness of heart, lowly in spirit, modesty. These are some terms that are used interchangeably. This is in opposition to, to pride and selfishness. Humility and gentleness. These are both character virtues. Actually, uh, things like humility and gentleness, they cannot just be taught in a classroom. It is something that you, you train with. Something that you learn in process. Something that you learn while going through life experiences. Meaning if you're praying for, like what Jesus was saying, learn from me in terms of gentleness and humility. It's not something that will be plopped in your heart and said, yeah, there you go, you're gentle, there you go, you're humble. You will go through life experiences. It's a process. There's no such thing as instant disciples. Anyone here instant disciples? Instant ramen, yes. Instant powder, yes. Instant juice, yes. But instant disciples, especially instant disciples of Jesus, no, no, no. There is no app that makes you click on it and you're instantly a disciple. Is there? Tell me. <laughs> There's no. There is no powdered drink that if you dissolve in 16 ounce cups will give you discipleship muscles. Have discipleship muscles. Not. There is no on-demand channel in your whatever cable company you're using. That you can tune in and click on demand, instant disciple of Jesus. No. There is no discipleship prime now. Is there? A subscription to discipleship prime with free delivery? <laughs> nope. <laughs> it is a lifelong process. Oh, let me highlight there. Discipleship here, becoming more like him. It's not one day that you're yoked with Jesus. It's a lifetime a lifelong process of becoming more and more like Jesus. There is no discipleship iCloud. Is there discipleship iCloud? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. 
Welcome to the 21st century. <clears throat> where a student today, whereas a student today studies a subject, you have a subject. You know, you study law, you study medicine, you study architecture, whatever subject. A disciple, a learner, in olden days, learned from a teacher. So you don't say, I go to this school or I study this subject. You say, I'm a follower of this teacher. I'm a follower of this rabbi, this rabboni. The Pharisees and John the Baptist had disciples. The Jews saw themselves as disciples of Moses. The term disciple, matete, learner, is used often in the Gospels and the Acts to describe the followers of Jesus. They learned from him and they attached themselves to him wholeheartedly to become more and more like him. So you start to make decisions like him. You start to like like him. You start to, you start to eat like him, walk like him, talk like him. You become more and more like him as you attach yourself and yoke together with Christ. It meant putting Christ before family and possessions. It meant taking up his cross today too. To be a disciple of Jesus means and calls for commitment. Total commitment to Jesus. I know you have problems about that. But Jesus has a good track record of seeing his disciples go from glory to glory. Trust him. Commit to him. And he will give you rest. That, that's so scary, Pastor. I'm brought up in a culture that I'm in charge. And that's, I don't see anything wrong with that except, except that the stress level that you're going through is because you're in charge. If you're fine, you don't have to listen to this, click away. But if you need that rest, if you need that refreshment, if you need the restoration of your souls, According to how Jesus is describing it. Come to him. He will give you rest. Amen? Let me give you the summary. Go to Jesus. I will give you rest, it says. It's stressful out there. That's not new. That's not news for the young and old. It's, life is hard. Amen? Are you okay? Some of you are starting to, something's pulling down your eyelashes. Something's kind of shading your eyelids. Some of you in tears from holding back your yawn. It's so difficult what you're doing. Life is hard. There's something that you can do about it. You can end it. Or, or, you can choose a life that surrendered to Jesus. You are not helpless. Amen? You are not a victim. You have options. We talked about this last week. You have options and you're free to choose. Please choose Jesus. Please try Jesus. Go ahead. Trust Him. You are never without options. There is deep down satisfaction and peace. For a really productive, meaningful, restful life in Jesus. My last word, be recharged today. Be refreshed in your spirit. Be restored in your mental, spiritual, and relational state. But it all starts with Jesus. After all, he was the one that promised, I will give you rest. Amen? I'm putting that up for a few more seconds for you. Take your picture so that you can share it with others. <clears throat> I'm going to ask everyone to stand right now. We're going to pray. It's a simple prayer. A prayer of acceptance. Those of you online and joining us, if you've never really experienced Jesus, Maybe you know about him. Maybe someone has told you about him. Maybe you even go to a certain church or synagogue or, or a temple to experience this person of Jesus. I'm not talking about religion or religious affiliation. I'm talking about a, a vital relationship, a personal relationship with him. 
Open your heart today. Even while I'm speaking, even while the Holy Spirit is, is prodding in your heart, you know God is speaking to you. Open your heart and accept Jesus and have Him lead the way and He promises He will give you rest. So I'm going to invite everyone to just bow their heads. Thank you.